just doesn't like that. Do we need to cut down the line a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, that would build the okay. thing, but... Can we cut the line down a little bit more? It's okay. We're not doing a clear future for the online students. Okay, that's a lot of layers. Okay. 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 There we go. Yeah, oh, that's too dark. <laughs> yeah. Uh, There's no halfway in between? No. Well, how about, no, go back up and one. Well, it's where that's a lot blue and the body is fine. It's not coming through. Well, we get into Okay. Let's just go with it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, I have four o'clock. Thank you for your patience. We are so you don't have to Oh, I'll blast them out. That's okay. Thank you. So we are uh, streaming this. There's well, over 60 people participating that way. I want to welcome all of you who are coming in person to the new graduate student orientation for spring 2018. We do a longer orientation in the fall. So I want to start off by inviting you to come to that one where there are guest speakers, opportunities for questions and answers. Um, but we wanted to make sure that you get to hear information that will help Rams and let you put a face to a name. So this is Shella Bennett, who does the audiology and speech language pathology programs. Angela Edwards, who does a ton of programs, art, biology, chemistry, criminal justice, forensic document examination, geosciences, history, psychology, public administration, sociology. Fiona Goodyear, who does a lot of programs in the College of Education. I'm not going to name all that list, but a lot of the uh, graduate programs in the College of Education. And um, Cindy Hill, who does uh, business programs as well as educational leadership uh, graduate program and a couple of related certificates and uh, digital marketing. Uh, Ricky Carter, who does a variety of programs, English, math, um, computer, brand and media strategy, professional communications, Appalachian studies, biomedical sciences. <clears throat> For some of you um, who are starting, and I know physical therapy students, especially because they start only in January, uh, Stacy Hill, who was uh, the program specialist for these programs, has taken another job at the university and we are replacing her. We should have that finished in about a month. Um, in the meantime, you can contact uh, the School of Graduate Studies main number or, um, or call the phone that's listed for Stacy Hill and we have that being directed to someone who can get you the answers that you need. Uh, Michelle Lamb does technology. Allied Health Clinical Nutrition Social Work. Don Rice does um, nursing, all the nursing programs, as well as the Master of Arts in Liberal Studies and Sport Physiology and Performance PhD. The other person that's uh, important, especially for the streaming students or anybody who's attending in person who's in an online program, Rebecca Lloyd in the back is the online graduate student liaison. So when you're way far off campus and you have an issue and you get told come in and fill out this form, you are not going to come in and fill out this form if you're across the country. You contact Rebecca and she helps facilitate how you can do that from distance. We also have a graduate student success specialist service and uh, we have uh, Christina Smith is here if you'd stand up and wave. I think she's giving out information. Um, this is a peer service. The, uh, Christina is in the counseling program, correct? And Brittany Bartholomew is in the Master of Social Work program. But they can help you with setting goals, time management, uh, community resources if you have an issue. And uh, they put out a newsletter, electronic newsletter you'll get in the mail, which will tell you some information that's helpful to you. Um, they are in the uh, shared library is their office. They've recently switched to a bigger office, room 453. Uh, their phone number um, and email, they share. Uh, if you go to our main website and scroll down, you'll see this icon. And if you click on that, it'll take you to the web page where they will post. Have you posted your spring hours yet? Oh, awesome. So their spring hours are posted if you, and she's got information uh, in the back to please take. Uh, you can go in person. You can talk to them by, by email, by phone call, whatever. 
It is absolutely confidential. The only person who knows that you've contacted them is you and them. Okay? Just want you to make sure that you understand that. Any questions about that? So you have bookmarks that have information, is that right? Do you want to go ahead and start passing some around so make sure everybody gets one? Do you have anything you want to say, Christina, that I forgot? Doug, maybe please come and see us. <laughs> uh, we ship you every day. Um, it's Doug's advisor. Did it get stuck with something or you just want to get it? Uh, we charge the door by picking this off in here. Okay. Um, it's just the only order that it's done. Please come and see us. Thank you. So how many of you have a graduate assistantship or tuition, graduate tuition scholarship? Yes, so several, quite a few. So I'm going to do just a couple of slides on important things for you to know. Some of that is good information for everybody to know as a student. I think I'm going way too fast, aren't I? I need to talk slower. I'm used to having to be fast. <laughs> okay. So if you have a graduate tuition scholarship, that is a service scholarship. And you're required to perform 120 hours of service a semester, which works out to about eight hours a week. So if you have one of those, you want to talk with the, the, your supervisor on working out those hours, um, you know, when it's convenient, all that kind of thing. In order to keep one of those, you have to stay in good academic standing. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but in graduate school, a 3.0 GPA is the minimum to be in good academic standing. B average is the minimum. If you have a bad semester and you slip under that one time, you get to keep a tuition scholarship or a GA one time on academic probation but then you really need to work to get your grades back up. Um, and if you don't, then you, you lose that uh, financial support. So please, if you're having difficulty, talk to your professor, talk to the student success specialists, talk to somebody early before it's, when you can still recover during the semester. Okay, make sure you do that. Graduate school is uh, intense. It's, it's very different than the pace in undergraduate education. And some programs, you're taking a lot of courses. Others that have a research component, you're spending a lot of time doing that. Learning to balance your time between all those competing demands is something that, that you need to get good at. And you can get advice to help you from the success specialists. Um, and if if you want to talk to me, I'll talk to you about time management and things like that because I've been to grad school too. Uh, and I was a single parent my last couple years of it and juggling all that and still finishing on time was, it took some real time management. So I have lots of pointers I will share. Um, graduate assistants are employees of ETSU in addition to being students. So for that, it's work. It's not service. It's work, 20 hours a week for a full GA. If you have a half GA, that's 10 hours a week. You get paid a stipend for that, and your tuition gets covered, either full tuition or half of it, depending on, on your level of appointment. Once again, you'll have a particular supervisor that you will be working with and interacting with, and you need to talk ahead about the hours. If you look on the graduate school website under assistantships, you'll see that there's a handbook posted. That has a lot of the policies and rules. So if you ever have a question about something, go there first. If it isn't clear, then ask us. Um, it does say in there that if some weeks you need to work more than 20 hours, say you need to work 25 or 30, that's okay as long as a nearby week you get to work less because sometimes things are more demanding. So some professors, for example, or supervisors, 
will give you a little more time during midterm week for your studies, but you work a little more a couple weeks before or a couple weeks after. I don't need to know all that. You work that out with them, okay? Now, if you think things are going way overboard, then we need to know so we can, can help. If you don't go, and you don't, if you're sick and you don't call and let them know so they don't know where you are and they can't cover what you were supposed to do or something like that, if you don't do it, then this is like a job. You can be counseled on how to get better and they can eventually be let go. So take it seriously. Not, not you know, a, less than 25% of students get that kind of financial support. And so um, there's plenty of other people that would like to have it if you don't want it. Um, so in both of those positions, whether doing your service activity or work activity, you are representing ETSU. And uh, the university is liable for things that you do, and so they want to make sure that you exhibit professional and appropriate behavior. So one of the things is to be sure to maintain proper boundaries. If you are in a teaching or research assistantship or an administrative one and you're interacting, for example, with undergraduate students, you need to be professional. They're not your friends. They are not your dating pool. Okay? That can get in trouble. Um, if, you come, if you come in the fall, Ed Kelly of the University Council can tell you some entertaining stories and he always disses himself like no one ever tried to ask me out on a date or whatever, but um, if a graduate, a GA, dates an undergraduate student and it goes bad and the undergraduate student complains, who do you think's in trouble? The GA, right? So you need to be professional. Um, if there are inappropriate interactions, a few years ago, one of my graduate students that worked with me a couple of the freshman boys had a big crush on her. She was pretty cute. Followed her all around campus. She was scared of them, okay? And so we had to talk with them about, you don't get to stalk her. <laughs> She's not interested in you. <laughs> uh, cut it out or you'll be out of the class. So that's an educational moment. They behaved after that and it was all fine. So um, sometimes the, the a, fre a freshman doesn't know how to behave correctly, so sometimes we have to help them learn that too. Make sure you report it to your supervisor. She reported it to me, and we found a way to handle it together. She didn't go threaten them on her own. We took care of that for her, okay? <laughs> All right, any questions about that? There are lots of resources to help you. You're not in this alone. How many of you are uh, going to be teaching, taking the uh, teaching pedagogy course for graduate assistants? Nope, none of them are here today. Okay, then I won't talk about that yet. So avoid starting any kinds of harassment. If you see it, report it. ETSU wants everyone to have a good educational environment, and we don't tolerate harassment of any sort. Uh, oh, there you go. I'm going to say it again. Don't date undergraduates. Document any issues, encounters, or concerns. Report anything like that to the supervisors, um, the dean, or the university council. You can contact the grad school. You can contact your graduate program specialist, and they'll get you referred to the right person to talk to. Um, one of the other things, if, if you happen to be teaching or working in an office, how many of you are, know about helicopter parents, that term? Yeah. Unless the student has signed a waiver that says that their parent can discuss them with anybody they feel like, you don't talk about it. You don't say if they've been to class or not. You don't say if they're failing or passing. You just say, I'm sorry, I can't discuss that with you and then you t tell them to go to your supervisor to get more information. There is a, I think it's a Buck Buddies form or something that the student can fill out that allows their parent to have access 
and to be able to talk to people. But if you don't know that, then you just say, a federal law doesn't allow me to discuss that. Uh, we have a very nice Office of Disability Services on campus. And if a student has registered with them and meets conditions for a particular accommodation, depending on what their disability is, um, you, as an instructor, you would be informed on, you will get a formal letter that tells you exactly what needs to happen. If they just tell you they need it, then you say, I need the letter from Disability Services. Okay. So one of, I think one of the real strengths that we have at ETSU is the engagement of our library with graduate students. Um, the, there are two academic librarians that work specifically um, with graduate students. Dr. Wendy Doucette is a graduate services librarian. She is there for you. You can make appointments. She can help you do all kinds of stuff, literature searches, all kinds of things. She offers a lot of workshops, free workshops at the library of um, things that can help you be successful as you start doing your library research and related um, activities. She's also involved in the thesis dissertation boot camp, which you may or may not hear about later. Um, that happens towards the end. And um, Joanna Anderson is the distance education librarian. And so m almost everything that Sherrod has is available uh, electronically, which is a great resource for you no matter where you are. You don't necessarily have to come to the library and check out a book. You can work from home and download stuff. And distance students uh, can uh, contact Joanne Anderson for particular uh, help that they might need. They have, oh, there we go. So um, they will send out announcements of workshops. So read the emails that come from the library. And I know you get inundated with emails. We did work with um, the um, email folks so that grad students are not supposed to get emails that are directed only to undergrads anymore before all students got everything. So we've taken some of that away from you. If we send you an email, we really like for you to read it. And, I, it's, and read one from the, uh, read anything you get from the library too because they're usually telling you about opportunities. The um, interlibrary loan service is awesome. If the library doesn't have something, you request it. Sometimes you have it the next day. It's that fast. There is a, a study room exclusively for graduate students. It was in 354. I just learned this morning that it's being moved to a better space on the fourth floor. It's key card access. So only graduate students can get in there. It's quiet study space. Dr. Doucette would say when you're tired of dealing with snotty undergraduates, go to the study space and go in there and be with graduate students. Um, there are other, other kinds of study and group rooms that are available in the library. The library is a little uh, more crowded than usual the next couple years because of the Culp Center renovation, and they've moved some offices in there. But there's still a lot of space, and they're very supportive, very, very supportive of graduate students. So I want to introduce some ideas of funding and professional development for graduate students. While well, I'm remembering it, the library um, has a um, award, a research award. It's not for like research on thesis or stuff. It will be for a really good paper you wrote for a class that can be nominated for it. I think is it five hundred dollars? It's five hundred dollars. So if you think you got a good grade on a paper, tell your professor to help you apply for that. We talked about the, uh, the graduate assistantships already and the tuition scholarships and the GATS handbook that's available. If you're in a thesis or dissertation program and you're at the very end, you have no, either you've never had a GA or you have <coughs> no GA support left, 
you can apply for this scholarship during your last term and it'll cover your tuition for the one to six credits that you might require uh, to finish. Very nice scholarship. It's helped a lot of people over that economic burden of being able to finish. There is a graduate assistant fee scholarship that's geared towards students in the humanities and social sciences. That gets awarded in fall, spring too, or just fall? Possibly, yeah. Yeah. Depends on yeah, it depends on the fund, yeah. And then the, uh, a new one for fall of 18 is a Bucks for Books scholarship. And I think that's a couple, 200 or $300 in the fall. So all of these kinds of things are something to, to um, apply for. The Quillen Scholarship is available to students in the first con congressional district, um, and that can be applied for at any time. And it can be, uh, you get it in addition to any other financial support that you get. It doesn't mean you can't have something else. We have a lot of professional development classes and workshops that are available for graduate students. There are six courses that have been developed. Um, two of them, uh, because of a, a, a need that faculty and the university knew that we had, and four of them in response to graduate student exit surveys, faculty surveys, and employer surveys about skill sets that they want to make sure graduate students get exposure to. So we have, um, these are all one credit, offered on uh, variable calendar, so it really works hard not to interfere with your course schedule. We have um, the art of self-marketing, career planning, interpersonal interactions for professionals, that's being offered for the first time this semester, leadership for professionals, teaching pedagogy for graduate assistants is offered fall and spring semesters, usually has 20 to 30 people in it every semester. That's giving you a skill set for if you're going to be teaching. If you think, if you don't have a teaching GA now, but you think you're headed for a career in academia, you should take it because it'll help you be ready for that. And then uh, responsible conduct of research. Some programs have a course like that already. If yours doesn't and you're going to be doing research, you might want to take that one and that's offered in spring. There's thesis dissertation preparation workshops offered every semester uh, in two parts. One is getting started for people who are just getting started in their program, and the other is the submission process for those who are ending. There's a GR preparation workshop offered every fall and spring. It has a, a modest fee associated with it. If you want to go on to another program that requires a GRE, and you haven't taken it yet, or you'd like to improve your score, that's a good workshop to take. It's one Saturday. The, um, and you get to do, um, you get refreshed on the verbal part, the reading and all that. Uh, they go over the, some of the math, in case you're rusty on that. And you also get to do a writing assignment that gets scored like the writing assignments that are on the GRE. And, um, the thesis dissertation capstone boot camp that's offered fall and spring and there's a fee associated with that and information goes out. And the School of Graduate Studies has a research grant uh, program and last semester Dr. Kirkby and Dr. Bartoszuk offered a workshop on strategies for doing that grant proposal. Those will be due in March. March 1st. March 1st. So if I bet if they get asked a bunch, they might consider having another one for all the new students who come in who might try to apply for that for March. Um, here we go. So here are some uh, awards and grants. We have an outstanding dissertation award, three outstanding thesis awards um, in um, art and humanities, science, math, technology, computer science, social sciences, education an outstanding capstone project. We have two excellence in teaching awards for a teaching assistant and teaching associate. We have uh, an award for someone who's done a service project that enhances the public good. And um, 
than the research grants. You have to be in a thesis or dissertation program. It's $500 to $800 uh, for you to help support research costs. You don't get to put it in your pocket. You have to spend it on stuff. So on our website, we have a lot more information about eligibility and how to apply. Um, we also have an ETSU Illuminated magazine that features research being done by graduate students on this campus, all kinds of different uh, research, uh, basic research, applied research, clinical studies. Um, this is um, Dr. Bartoszczyk is the editor, but the interviews and the write-ups are done by graduate students, and the layout of the magazine is also done by graduate students. They're electronic, so you can go on and click and scroll through and see. We also have an Appalachian Student Research Forum every spring. So when you get to a point of having done a research project, it could even be for a class or it could be you know, something else, that's good opportunity for you to practice giving a presentation, especially if you think you might go to a professional meeting later. It's really good practice. Any questions? I don't see anybody sleeping yet, so it must be okay. So we're going to take a moment now to draw three names for door prizes, and then Dr. Kirkby will do the end, and we'll have door prize, more door prizes at the end. So, oh, I get to do it. I think if you want to come up uh, and pick, this room is short enough, we can do that. There's coffee mugs. Um, umbrellas. umbrellas and t-shirts, graduate school t-shirts. Okay. And I hope I can read your writing. Allison Gante. Yeah, so you can come up. But you get first pick of everything. And the umbrellas do have our wonderful graduate studies logo on them. And for those who are participating by streaming, we'll do a random drawing of their names and mail them something later. Elizabeth McCarty Pavlovic. Did I, did I do okay? Pavlovic. Okay, Pavlovic. And the last one of this part is Amanda Tennyson. Oh, okay. So we'll leave those there so we don't pick them again. I think this is you. I'll give you the microphone and I'll take my water in. Okay, so we'll take a look in the next section at uh, student services, very whirlwind tour. So campus safety programs, we have a Department of Public Safety, essentially our police force, their fully trained police fire response force, their emergency phones scattered across campus, the outside ones are the red towers, and push a button and get some help. We also have shuttle and security escort service, it's called Safe Voyage, uh, you can search that on our website. The also have response if you have some car trouble with an air compressor for a flat tire or a battery charger for a dead battery. Housing safety is card access. There's also night patrol for the university housing. The university has a university-wide gold alert system. On the ETSU homepage, you can see the, if there's a major alert, it will take over the entire homepage, but up at the top, there are flags of different colors for the various alerts and tell you outages, for example, of elevators. Um, if you need handicap access, which are the alternate routes to get to various classrooms uh, for different outages. Do they do, if we close for snow and stuff, do that goes on there too? Right? If we close for weather, yes, it yeah. does go there. Um, information can also be sent via your text. You can register at uh, getrave.com slash login slash ETSU, so you'll get text messages about the university alerts that are there. Uh, if you're sitting on a university computer or computer attached to the university net or university computer attached to the network, if there is a major alert, 
um, it will take over the screen and provide the information that you need for that. We also have uh, weather sirens for tornado alerts. They usually run a drill early in the semester, so if you hear those go off, it's probably the drill um, in February, not quite yet in tornado season, hopefully. For health information, we have the ETSU Counseling Center that can provide confidential um, mental health services and counseling to students. There's also a dental hygiene clinic. They're always in need of um, patients for their students. Um, so the clinicians are patients, um, but they are, or excuse me, are students, so but they are extremely well ser supervised, so the level of care is very good, um, but low cost for routine types during their training procedures. There's also student health services for students. For international students, there's a health insurance program to meet the mandates of the insurance they must have. For domestic students, it's your traditional health insurance applies. There's also an Office of Disability Services that can help not just in the academic paperwork for accommodations and adjustments for coursework, but also to connect you with the, right, with the appropriate services in the community to assist in your needs. Also, we are a tobacco-free environment. Smoking and other tobacco use is prohibited on the entire campus in all circumstances except in your private vehicle. And that's in your vehicle, not around your vehicle. The University offers Bucky's Food Pantry to help address issues of food insecurity, both for graduate and undergraduate students. You can also request help for personal hygiene items in addition to food. Um, the Graduate Success Specialists have detailed information, off hours availability, who also in the wider community to contact for these issues. So I would recommend starting with them first. Um, probably a little easier than go, trying to go directly to each of the individual services. There are also seed donation boxes. If you can help, please help. There's a constant demand for food and other items in the university community. The location of the pantry is at Central Receiving, which is up near the Buckridge Apartments up the hill. It's a very good location. The benefits of it is that it's discreet because hardly anyone's there. The downside is it's out of the way and hardly anyone is there. Contact information and the website is slash food pantry, but again, my recommendation be start with the graduate student success specialist. They can help you with anything and everything related to non-academic assistance. New this year is the Bucky's Career Closet. At ETSU, we want our students to be prepared academically, obviously, but part of getting that success or getting to that success is being able to present yourself properly during interview process or job career and job fair process. And so they're currently seeking donations from the community um, to help with interview and job fair appropriate attire for students that will be able to get that um, to have the appropriate wardrobe for the interview process. So the closet operations begin as soon as they have a sufficient supply of clothing. And again, the pantry will have information and the success specialist will have the information. You can also contact Career Services at career.etsu.edu with the subject Bucky's Career Closet for additional assistance. Parking included in the fees that you pay as a student is one parking decal. Additional or lost decals can be replaced for modest fee at Parking Services 132 Stout Drive. If you're temporarily driving a different vehicle, you can get a temporary parking permit um, on request at the same location. They do have a drive through window making it fairly convenient for temporary ones. Um, Across campus, lots are designated faculty, staff, student, or mixed usage. You can tell what slots are what. Blue is faculty, staff. Yellow is students, no color, or both colors are mixed. To function reasonably on campus, you do need an official ID card, because that's also your swipe card for swipe entry access, library access, access to the graduate study room, events and sporting 
like sporting events or concerts, you'll need a photo ID and university issued photo ID for student access. The Center for Physical Activity, which always gets abbreviated, I think, to the CPA. Um, door access and turnstile access requires your ID. Also, you can put funds on your ID card and then use it at locations on campus and near the campus to spend it a bit like a debit card or a university sponsored debit card. University Bookstore, there are three, loca three local locations, the main campus and the Culp Center, Follett Books, which is behind the McDonald's over on West Walnut, and the medical bookstore on the VA campus. I do want to say with the Culp renovation, the one in the Culp Center will be relocated, but we don't know where yet. Yes. <laughs> so uh, in the future, you might have to go somewhere else, else on campus. What you'll hear in the next couple of months is when the CULP Center renovations for a lot of services that are now located in the CULP. The CULP will be undergoing major renovations for about two years. There will be major disruptions, major relocations of those services. And so patients and <coughs> we'll let you know as best we can once we figure out where stuff is being relocated. And it'll probably be a bit of a shuffle process so things won't stay static for that whole two years. Important ETSU dates and campus events are on the ETSU calendar. The events calendar is at planetetsu.edu. There's also a separate academic calendar. Uh, it does include all the important academic dates. The downside is it does include all the important academic dates for everyone. So it can be a little bit of an effort to sift through um, all of the information that's there. If you go to the graduate school's website, on the sidebar, there's an important dates. Click that. Before it takes you to the full academic calendar, it'll have a summary of important dates relevant just to graduate students. And that will help you and we'll keep that updated. Uh, so things like thesis and dissertation deadlines and the like. Since you're here, you must have a university email address. All of Official university correspondence by university policy must go through your university email address. And so if you send us something from your private email and we have to reply with any academically related information, we're going to send that directly to your ETSU email address. We have to do that. So for example, if you apply to the grant program that I supervise and you put on the grant form that you're email is at gmail something, I'm still going to send any notice of funding or not funding to your ETSU one and because that's what I must do. So if you miss the deadline because you didn't look at your ETSU email address, which unfortunately does happen, I'm sorry we have to use that. It's required by university policy. And this is in compliance with the Federal Education Rights and Privacy Act, which we always abbreviate to FERPA. FERPA is a big deal to us. We have to protect your privacy. The fines are astronomical, even for accidental disclosures. So for those of you who are teaching GAs, accidents can be very expensive, so keep it in mind as well. So important information will always be sent to your ETSU address. Check your account regularly. You can set your account up to forward to your private account. What you do with it once we've sent it to your ET is up to you but we can only send it to your ETSU email address. These accounts will stay with you for as long as you are an alum, so essentially the rest of your life, or until the university changes its policy again. But it's a good way to stay connected um, once you have graduated, because your classmates will also keep that, so it's a good way to stay connected. And I think most people can handle multiple email accounts these days. We also have a full service post office at the university. It is a full service, not just a drop. Um, so commuting students can request a campus PO box online through Goldlink or at the post office website. As I said, it is a full service unit. You can even get your passport issued there, renewed there. Um, if you do have a box and you want to use that as your official um, mail location or mail address, please include your box number in any official correspondence. 
So policies, or at least the short version of policies. So as any big entity, we have our bureaucracy, and the bureaucracy always needs to be satisfied. There is paperwork involved in that, even if it is electronic paperwork rather than physical paperwork. So what we'll look at today are policies governing admissions. Most of you successfully completed the first part of that, at least, to be here. Policies governing your progress in your program, and policies governing graduation. So your catalog of record is the catalog that's in effect at the time you started. So if all of you are brand new today, your catalog of record is the 2017-2018 graduate catalog. So it can change year to year. It does change year to year, though your particular program might not change. If the requirements for you, the degree in your program change next year, that doesn't matter to you. What you need to do for you to graduate successfully is what is in this year's catalog right now. So any changes do not apply retroactively. So catalogs listed at catalog.etsu.edu. My recommendation is go directly. Um, Google is not your best friend on searching for the catalog because Google, of course, makes use of frequent searches. The older catalogs have been searched more frequently than the newer catalogs. And if you're not paying attention, you could be looking at one three or four years old, which, again, may have changes that don't match what you're now responsible for. So if these requirements will not change, you will not be responsible for them. You may change your catalog to a later year. So for example, if your program changes a requirement that you think makes your life easier or better rather than the current ones, you could move to next year's catalog when that change comes in. Unfortunately, you cannot move backwards. So you can't go to last year's catalog if you think the change makes your life worse than it would have been a year ago. So all of you have been admitted under one of these three categories. Unconditional admission, you meet the normal ETSU graduate school and department requirements for your program. Unconditional admission with provisions, you may be dismissed from the program if you don't meet the provisions listed in your admissions letter. So provisions come in different forms, take a particular extra course, maintain a particular GPA, do something else that's related to your academic program, such as meet with an advisor, whatever the provisions are, you are required to complete those provisions either within the first semester or within the time period indicated in your admissions letter. Usually it's the first semester, but if, for example, if it's to take a particular course but it's not offered until next fall, you won't get into trouble because you have to wait till next fall. Also the third category is non-degree admission. You can register for classes for personal enrichment leisure, et cetera, but remember you cannot petition to transfer more than nine credit hours into a degree program. So you come take some general interest courses, you like what you're doing, you want to switch to the degree. If you've taken too many of these non-degree courses, that nine hour limit, can, nine credit limit can force you then to maybe take some additional credit hours to complete your degree. So policies governing progress. If you're a thesis or dissertation student, we have people here in a thesis or dissertation program. Few. Don't know yet. All the PTs, of course, are saying no. What's he talking about? OK, so if you are a thesis or dissertation student, consider attending the spring or summer EDT workshop. Again, it comes in two parts, the getting started part and the finishing part. For you, it would be the getting started first part. We will let you know with email and time and place for distance students to participate through streaming. The spring one is on February 28th, and the summer one is on June 13th. We'll give you a broad outline and a set of steps to help you get started on your thesis and dissertation product, project in good order. The university's access portal for essentially everything within our secure network is Goldlink. It allows you to register for classes online, check your course grades, fill out secure forms, access the um, electronic learning service 
We use the Desire to Learn course management system, which of course gets abbreviated to D2L. So when you hear your professor say it's on D2L, it's our course management system for those of you who are not familiar with it. Just about anything and everything that needs to be secure access is through the Goldlink portal. So, to maintain good standing, and just about everything requires a graduate student to be in good standing, you must maintain a 3.0 GPA. The first semester below a 3.0 cumulative GPA may result in you be playing, excuse me, may result in you being placed on probation. Probation is possible but not mandatory. The possible part is up to your program. Continued semesters below a 3.0 cumulative GPA, and you'll face dismissal from the program. Also, if you hold a GA and a TS, you're only allowed that first semester to keep your GA and TS. Additional semesters on probation would be without your GA or TS. Okay. Unlike for graduates, an F grade in graduate school remains on your transcript forever and is factored into your GPA even if you retake the class. So both attempts or if necessary, how many multiple attempts will show up. Also remember in graduate school there are no Ds. Nothing less than a C counts, except the F. Okay. No more than 30% of your courses counted for your graduate degree can be 5XX7 or 5956 courses for master's students. These often get referred to as cross-listed courses or special topics classes, depending on your program. There'll be 4,000 level series equivalents, so you may end up with undergrads taking what sounds like the same class, it's just the undergrad version versus the graduate version of highly similar courses. Doctoral students cannot take any of the 5XX7 classes, which are the special topics. Every program has a matriculation limit, that's how long you can take to graduate from the point you've started. It's four to six years for a certificate, six years for a master's degree, five to seven years for an educational leadership, EDD, and seven years for most of the other doctorates. What this means is that if you take a class, go away for 10 years, come back, you're starting over again. You're not picking up where you left off if you're past the matriculation limits. We will supply plenty of notification if you're close to your limits, so it should not come as a surprise, but of course you have to pay attention to the emails and phone calls and letters that we try to direct your way. For thesis and dissertation students, once you enroll in a course called thesis and or dissertation, it depends on master's versus doctoral level, you must be continuously enrolled in thesis and dissertation readings and research or research until you finish, including the summer. So my recommendation for thesis and dissertation students is speak with your research advisor, speak with your graduate coordinator. Don't take this until you're properly ready for it. Okay. Is that a question at the back or just a stretch? All right. Are there any questions? So a full-time load for graduate students is typically 9 to 12 credits. For professional programs and for the instructional part of some of the teaching programs, that will seem like a smaller number. Um, talk to your graduate program coordinator for what is the right thing um, for your program um, when you're scheduling your classes, your advisor if it's no longer your coordinator, your research advisor for thesis and dissertation students. For thesis and dissertation students, the most important thing you're going to do as a graduate student is your thesis and dissertation. So get an advisor at the right speed, don't dawdle, nothing good happens when you're passive in graduate school, and take the courses that you need to take, but concentrate on what's most important for you. Okay. Be sure to investigate and apply to, for all grants, scholarships that you're eligible for, completion scholarships, in-state tuition scholarships, research grants, etc. There's a lot of things we can do to help, but if you leave it to the last minute, our options get much, much smaller. Okay. You'll have several forms you need to submit to the graduate school. 
as you continue your program, committee forms, programs of study, candidacy forms, intent to graduate forms, stay in pro contact with your graduate program coordinator to make sure you turn in the right forms at the right time and that they're done correctly. Failing to do so can result in failure to graduate when you plan to. Probably I think the sneakiest form on the list is the intent to graduate. It can often catch people by surprise, especially since it doesn't roll over. So if you fill out your intent to graduate for a fall semester, your program takes longer, and you forget to fill out a new form for the spring, you can get yourself not graduating until the next go around. It's unfortunate, but that's how it works. You have to apply to graduate. You have to file your intent to graduate. And don't miss the deadlines. The deadlines for a lot of these forms are very early in the semester. Programs of study forms will list your courses that you're required to take. For those of you in professional clinical programs, they tend to be fairly limited choices, and so they're fairly straightforward. For those of you in thesis dissertation programs, there's often a lot more choice or a lot more variability in what courses you're taking when you're taking them. Programs of study help the graduate school make sure that you've done everything you're supposed to do to need to graduate. So turn them in at the recommended times. If you turn it in at the last minute and one of our specialists noticed, hey, there's this core course that you were supposed to take and you haven't taken, you're not graduating. So if we get them early, we can make sure you're on track. If we get them late, we'll fix it, but the fix may take an extra semester. And of course, an extra semester at your expense. So research resources policies. Research on this campus must comply with federal, state, and local laws and regulations from wherever the sponsoring entity or regulations that they impose. So whether it's a national granting agency like the Department of Education, the Department of Defense, National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, or a private um, charity like the American Cancer Society, they will put conditions on how they will allow their grant money to be spent on a particular kind of research. For thesis and dissertation students, your research advisor will probably be most concerned about this, but if you hold a private grant of your own, you'll be responsible for following the policies for that grant. So be careful, avoid any contamination of your data, avoid bias. These are part of academic integrity, research integrity issues. Accurately report your results and state the significance of your work. Make sure you can do your statistical analysis correctly. Give credit to the work and scholars on whom your work is based. I've never heard of a student getting in trouble for too many acknowledgments or too many references. Too few is often much more problematic. Treat animal and human subjects with respect. Avoid conflicts of interest, protect confidential information, and protect intellectual property. So there's more information on the Office of Research and Sponsored Projects website about all the compliance that goes into conducting research in the academic environment. All human subject research in the United States requires an institution to have an institutional research board, the IRB. They govern human subject research on this campus. So ETSU's IRB governs hu human subject research on this campus. All research involving human subjects requires their approval. And they get to decide what human subject research is or is not. So something as simple as interviewing someone may be human subject research. It might not, depending on the circumstances. Using personal data, depending on its source directly from the human being, or from census set may or may not be human subject research. But the call is theirs and theirs alone to make. So surveys, questionnaires, focus groups, any interaction with people, groups, any manipulation of a person's environment, accessing a person's private information. Basically, if it's a human, it's possibly human subject research and you need their approval to conduct it or their release declaring it's not human subject research. Oh, so you can get their information at the IRB. 
Requests for approval must be submitted before the research begins. Don't leave it to the last minute. It takes, at best, several weeks, possibly longer, to get approval. They're a very busy committee. If you conduct human subject research without their approval, you may be subject to federal, state sanctions, including potentially criminal sanctions. At the very least, your data is unpublishable. Unpublishable means you can't include it in your thesis and dissertation since that is a publication. Okay. Potentially, you can be dismissed from the program for violating IRB laws. The other thing, when you're finishing up with your thesis and dissertation, you will be required to submit your documentation to our electronic thesis and dissertation site. Some of it, the IRB approval letters we keep on file. The one thing, since I'm the one that reviews theses for final compliance, is the informed consent that you gave your subjects, did you do what you said you were going to do? So confidentiality can vary from none to complete. So you can have in your thesis complete identification of this person. As long as that's what they have agreed to, that's fine. But if you said you'll protect their privacy, they'll be completely confidential, then you'd better have maintained that. And the IRB will approve what's necessary for each step. We also have a committee on animal care. We are governed by federal, state, and local regulations for the use of animals in research. The ETSU Committee on Animal Care must give approval for the research before it begins. Biosafety and Chemical Safety Committee, any research that involves the use of biohazards, recombinant DNA, toxic or hazardous materials of any kind must be submitted to the ETSU Biosafety and Chemical Safety Office before the material is required. For those of you in programs that make use of biosafety and chemical safety, you're rarely starting from scratch. Those programs know what they're doing, have been in compliance. You'll be required to go to the appropriate training programs before you can start work. It's not usually that complicated as long as you follow the policies and procedures that are in place. Then again, maybe it just seems not complicated because I'm used to it. Radiation safety, so any use of radiochemical or radiation source must be approved by the Radiation Safety Committee before it begins. Again, most of this kind of research occurs in the sciences, biomedical sciences and the like. Your research advisor <coughs> will be experienced with this kind of work and be able to direct you through the appropriate approval and training processes that will be required. Any direct research approval questions can be directed to our Office of Research and Sponsored Programs, so slash research or 439-6000. One of the really good functioning units in this campus is our research office. They are more than willing to help, and they're more than capable of helping you get the information you need to get. One more thing, please make sure to pay all fees, make payments and arrangements to the bursar's office. So Bergen Doss at second floor by the end of January 12th to be sure that your classes are not canceled at the end of that day. This will help avoid having to register and pay a late registration fee. The term of art that gets used is that you'll be purged if you don't. I think their registrar's office is trying to find a word that doesn't sound quite so drastic but the effect will remain drastic. You'll be removed from your classes if you haven't made arrangements to pay or haven't completed payment. Again, nothing good happens by being passive in graduate school. Take the initiative. There's lots of things we can do to help. There are lots of people on this campus that want to help you be successful, but you have to talk to us first. So. This is the abbreviated version. Our fall orientation is much more extensive. It also includes the people who are the experts in the legal areas and the safety areas and the like. So please, please, please attend the new fall orientation to get the full treatment for these topics. Also, there'll be additional door prizes, so more opportunities to win. And thank you for your attention. And are there any questions? 
Okay. Yeah. When and where do we get our uh, parking pass and student ID after we pay tuition? The 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 uh, I don't I don't think the ID office has moved yet. Okay. So it should be in the call center on the first floor. Okay. Second floor. It's the first floor. From, well. Oh, if you haven't noticed everything, yes. So it's still there. Okay, we got assurances. And if you haven't gotten your parking detail, was it mailed to you? It's the little gray building, uh, lonely-looking little gray building on uh, on University Parkway. That's where you can get that. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so if you haven't noticed, we have hills around here. Ground floor can be a confusing description for a great number of buildings here. Okay. Let's get some more, three more door prizes. Three more door prizes. Adam Botts just left. Justin Yakel. All of that group that just walked out. Stacy Holden, I'm on a streak here. Lauren Morris, <laughs> batting a thousand or zero, I guess, depending on. Jess Appleby, Yay. hey. <laughs> Victoria Wright. Now, you must be present to win. For all these people who uh, whose names are being called and you're not sure they all do. Are there, there are people who are going to go and tell them about this, right? Yeah. Okay. Kyle Hirschberger. Caitlin Mullins. Well, again, thank you all for coming. And truthfully, please go grab a cookie on your way out. <laughs> if you have any questions or issues or happy, happy news, make sure you let us know.